history should really be called art philosophy. And if you mix in some sociology and economics as well, along with some world history, then you either have one of the most challenging fields known to mankind, or you also have one of the most low pain and difficult to job search for hobbies and obsessions the world has ever known. If you're familiar with the phrase cultural capital, then you should be a fan of art history already. Cultural capital is measured intangibly in terms of monetary economic wealth as we currently know it, but it is one of the byproducts that is essential in being human and one of the things that humans do really well as a natural matter of course in their individual psychology and their group sociologies. As with most discussions of say philosophy or true-false equations, the key here is balance. That for every reaction there's an opposite and equal reaction as above so below. So uh, this is p part of the fractal perfection of nature. It's also the perfection that Arist Aristotle spoke about um, and Aristotelian logic uh, espouses when it suggests that there's always a divine counterpart uh, which exists out in the universe as a mental concept as well as a physical uh, corresponding incarnation of said concept. So for every chair there is the concept of that chair by its maker existing pre-thought out in the universe as they created that chair or envisioned that chair. This is the physical corresponding to the metaphysical, the visceral corresponding to the cerebral. This is true nature at its perfect sacred geometry point. Have casual observers always viewed avant-garde works as a matter of not knowing exactly what it is that attracts them, but knowing what they like when they see it? This is what Rosalind Krauss seems to be illustrating when she uses algebra in the form of x plus y equals xy in her paper, The Motivation of the Sign. It seems that this question can be universally applied to all art forms, except for one notion of aesthetic, the application of the Spartan. I say this because in the debate of which came first, the form or the function, in folk art and particularly in radical Protestant art of North America, for example, the Shakers, Quakers, Calvinists, and Puritans, cleanliness of line and simplicity is integrated as a statement with the mundane function that said object performs. The notion of these qualities being desirable is far from being Americentric. Even the Eastern concepts of Zen Buddhism seem to have had great impact on contemporary art. For example, concept art, minimalism, gutai, abstract expressionism, then say the works of the European masters of Versari, for example, as a counter counterpoint. You get my meaning. They are not the European masters of Vasari. Nope, nope, nope. No Baroque for you. If it ain't Baroque, 
don't fix it. It may seem inconsequential in the overview of art history deliberation, but with regard to a multidisciplinary focus in the analysis of art, where are the delineations between theosophical, philosophical, and varying reflections of the same historical events? Is Zen cited in observations of the genesis of so many contemporary art styles because of an allure for its impenetrable quixotic root? Perhaps this contingent vicissitudinousness is drawn upon as a reflection of our increasingly changing world and the desire for combined control and simplification. The multilateral nature of art, be it object or act, is ideally inclusive of both those who have no need to ruminate upon the spectacle and those who devote their whole being towards internalizing the meaning beyond said spectacle. It is a temptation to imitate Plato, to simply cast off any strivings toward an ultimate in perfection to be manifested, and disavow the power of thought being made real here on earth. Certainly dissatisfaction, the yearning to excel, can be stated if a human so wishes and they could exist in a satori, a state of balance and malaise. Humanity would lose the push and shove against strife, which is necessary to fuel the passion of yearning for and attaining more than those who came before in any field could ever possibly have imagined. With regard to the relativity as to what constitutes the height of beauty, the answer must come forward in a subjective form, since the question is posed likewise, hearkening back to the Rosalind Krauss article already mentioned, I believe the clearest definition is one which centers on the notion of contrast. In the same way, as our solar system expands outwards as to simultaneously maintains pockets of centrifugal force. In order to maintain subjective individualistic points of view concerning human endeavors, the counterpoint must be equally subjective, which taking into account such huge variables in variety can only mean that aesthetic beauty is determined by its corresponding partner, the contrast of abjection. In the case of Winkleman's reverence for the neoclassical, taking into account his like-minded preceding and subsequent revisionist compatriots, their own contemporaneous events have been determined by Winkleman and others who reach back in time to gain inspiration for moving forward, as being for them the epitome of abjection. In this concoction of a cacophony of influences or multiple zeitgeists throughout the eras, the revered ideal becomes a concocted amalgam of the past. However, I cannot agree that this eliminates the occurrence of innovation. There is always something new under the sun when viewed by new eyes and presented in distinctive ways. Even a good idea forgotten loses no credence as a good idea. Ideas which have the power to be made into reality. And any idea which might concern the likes of Plato must be worthy of human contemplation indeed. The discipline of art history is a vast ocean, 
and like an ocean, the numerous approaches to its depths can overwhelm even the most devoted sailor. So why am I telling you this and why would I go into this field when I could have gotten a registered nursing degree? Well, there's actually a really good reason because, you know, you should follow your heart when it comes to what you want to do. And the reason that I decided to pursue art history and musicology and digital art and so on um, and archives is because I wanted to protect uh, things that I loved and cared about and to tell stories that were passed on to me and to do so at the pinnacle of technology at the pinnacle of uh, what the industry standard is for conservation of cultural memories and so I wasn't really thinking hey my my country doesn't really value a lot of stuff like that or this is really gonna be a hard sell to try and just you know regurgitate everything I've I've crammed in my brain um, on the spot on a get to know you interview um, you know but uh, I went with my heart and now my heart is open for all of you here at Mystic Ashram so thank you so much for joining me and remember if it ain't Baroque don't fix it comments questions concerns anything about this video and you like it or you just want to share your feelings just write that's cool there's there's comments that's cool okay appreciate it so much and uh, have a good one take care from mr. Gosham signing off <laughs>